Hi, I'm Dan Rundy. I hold the Schreier Chair here at CSIS. Welcome to our new building. For those of you who haven't been to our new building, I'm, uh, we're here to talk about develop democracy and development perspectives on the new USAID DRG, the Democracy, Human Rights, and Governance Strategy. I think you have copies of it outside. Um, the uh, thanks for coming in the rain. Um, we're going to hear from a number of thoughtful folks, folks I admire, folks I consider friends and colleagues. Uh, and we're going to be talking about um, a series of issues that I think are critical to the future of development and critical for our national security. Um, there's been a long standing policy in the United States of supporting democratic governance and human rights for decades. Uh, certainly, people think about uh, Ronald Reagan's speech uh, in the UK uh, and the launching of the National Endowment for Democracy and the, the NED institutions, as well as a series of other institutions that support democracy, human rights, and governance um, that are also represented here in the room uh, as well. I also think the, the research that's been done, uh, folks like Douglas North or the work of uh, the uh, authors of Why Nations Fail, but also the, uh, the book, The Dem Democracy Advantage, many of these are, are cited in the, in the strategy that we want to be working towards good governance, but we want to be working towards uh, democratic governance. That ought to be the strategic goal of the United States, and um, I think there's a broad base of support for that. And many of the folks I most admire in the democracy and development community uh, are people like my friend Jennifer Windsor, who's coming up, coming up the aisle here, who's going to be joining us from Freedom House, but also people like Ken Wallach, who runs NDI, as well as uh, Madeleine Albright, um, uh, are, all, are all happen to be Democrats. I'm a Republican, but these are all people I've, I've admired very, very much. I came to this work uh, after George Bush's 2005 Freedom Agenda speech. I actually uh, was inspired by George Bush's Freedom Agenda speech and spent much of my time in the rest of the Bush administration helping to support dissident groups in Belarus and supporting a number of democracy initiatives and with partners such as uh, European donor governments and philanthropy and working with many of the partners, some of them which are in this room. So um, I came to it through through that, through my public service, but the folks I've most admired have been uh, uh, are across, uh, across the political spectrum. And so it's real uh, privilege to have uh, representatives from the Obama administration who are going to talk about the strategy. I think there's uh, the fact that it's a rainy day and we have a full house, I think, speaks to the deep interest uh, in the new strategy. I think people have a number of questions and are uh, excited about the, the new strategy as well. So without further ado, I'm going to have first my friend Larry Garber, who's Deputy Assistant Administrator at USAID, uh, speak to uh, the strategy, and then David Yang, who's the Director of Excellence on Democracy, Human Rights, and Governance in the Bureau for Democracy, Conflict, and Humanitarian Assistance, unpack the strategy, and then we're going to have a panel discussion with, um, with some friends of mine. Uh, Kim, uh, Jim Kunder, uh, Jennifer Windsor, and Bill Sweeney are all going to. We're going to have a discussion about about the uh, about the uh, strategy and the broader conversation about democracy, human rights, and governance, as well as uh, then I think have a, a series of questions and a, and a conversation uh, with the audience. So without further ado, Larry, I'm going to ask you to come up if you would, please. Oh, and just one last thing. The good news is we have a, a new building. The bad news is we're still working out some of the AV detail, details, so it's going to be a little bit like karaoke night at CSIS. So just bear with us. Okay. Do I need this? Yes. You, oh, no, you actually don't because we have two folks that are lavaliered, and uh, there are two friends from USAID. Go ahead. So first of all, there, there are seats in the front if people want to sit. So I encourage you because it's going to be an exciting program, but uh, you may not want to stand for the entire time. Uh, so let me start by uh, thanking Dan uh, for hosting uh, this meeting and for being, uh, in general, quite supportive of our efforts uh, in this realm. Uh, and congratulations to you and to CSAS on this beautiful new building. Um, we hope that we will be able to make use of it uh, many times and, uh, you know, wish, wish, wish you the best. And, and also, a big thanks for, of appreciation for accommodating us uh, during our own uh, democratic dysfunction a, a, a month ago. Um, <clears throat> looking at this panel, um, you know, one might think we are here to describe the uh, USAID 1994 strategy um, rather than the one that we uh, <clears throat> issued in 2013. Uh, indeed, Jennifer, David, and I uh, were all intimately involved in the drafting and implementing of the 1994 document, uh, and Jim and Bill were uh, very interested uh, observers and uh, participants in other ways. 
So in, 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 a, <clears throat> in effect, uh, the challenge for David and myself uh, this morning is to convince you that the strategy we have developed uh, reflects both our learning from the past 20 years and the realities of the current global uh, environment. Um, the structure of, of my presentation is to say a word about USAID's uh, policy formulation process, why we developed the new strategy, what has changed with this new strategy and what has not changed, and some challenges. And then David will go into a little bit more detail on some of the specifics that are in the strategy. Um, when we uh, decided to revive uh, a Bureau of Policy Planning and Learning at USAID at the outset of the um, uh, Obama administration, um, one of the key uh, issues that we debated was how we should structure a process for uh, policy formulation. Uh, we could have assigned the task to the Bureau of Policy Planning and, and Learning and, and just had uh, the Bureau be responsible for policy formulation, or we could have uh, done what we often do at USAID, which is uh, contract out uh, some expert like Dan Rundy or someone else to come in and write it for us. Uh, but instead, we decided that um, we would establish a series of what we called policy task teams, which would comprise individuals from different parts of USAID to address uh, the key de development issues that we uh, are confronting. In the case of uh, the DRG strategy, we were very fortunate to put together a superb team that was led by Josh Kaufman and Carol Sehi uh, and Barbara Smith, who's here in the audience uh, now with the Asia Foundation. Um, and they were joined by Carl Mabzino, who serves in the F Bureau, but with an extensive background in the health sector. Wei Channel, who at the time was in our E3 Bureau. Uh, Neil Levine from our Conflict Man Management and Mitigation Office. Uh, Alex Sokolovsky, who I saw just walk in uh, from our Europe uh, <coughs> and Eurasia Bureau. Uh, Laura Pavlovich, who's here, who had just come in from serving several years as a uh, democracy officer in Ukraine. Um, and Chloe Schwenke, who's here, where are you, Chloe? Over here, uh, who is then in our Africa Bureau and now is a, a vice president uh, at Freedom House. So as you can see, it was a, a diverse group. Um, and they spent uh, probably more time than they imagined uh, wanting to spend, but they spent time reviewing USAID's considerable experience over the past 20 years, soliciting input from our field staff and our <coughs> implementing partners uh, and debating among themselves, so often quite passionately, regarding both conceptual and operational issues. Uh, and while the process took lo longer than certainly I and others envisioned, um, I believe that the agency benefited considerably from allowing the team to engage what turned out to be both a reflective and practical exercise. But why did we need a new uh, DRG strategy? Uh, was not the handiwork that we had uh, developed 20 years ago still applicable? And in some ways, as I think you'll hear, it, it was. And, and we still uh, have incorporated some of the key components of the uh, 1994 strategy into the current document. But <clears throat> the world has changed uh, in, in dramatic fashion. And I'll just highlight a few of those changes that I think affected our considerations in uh, developing the new strategy. First of all, 20 years ago, we did not have either the uh, Millennium Development Goals or the aid effectiveness declarations that have come out of Paris, Accra, and Busan uh, to guide our development efforts. We were operating very much in a pre-9-11 world. Thus, while we were cognizant of terrorism and the implications, we were not engaged in two extended military operations which require uh, still uh, an active USAID involvement as well, there, uh, as well as other areas where this confluence of security issues and development issues have rose to the forefront. Technology changes have also dramatically changed the landscape. The amount of information available to citizens around the world, as well as organizations and governments, has geometrically expanded, as has the ability of individuals and organizations to communicate among themselves through social media and other means that were not available 20 years ago. And last, we developed a new strategy in the shadows of what was then called the Arab Spring. Um, and, and it very much influenced us, but as, as some of the, those developments uh, started not 
looking as good as uh, at the outset, I think we tempered some of our um, some of the, the the points in the in the strategy, and particularly we became much more conscious of what we now call the phenomenon of uh, the closing space uh, for civil society organizations. And you know, as part of this, President Obama highlighted uh, this issue on closing space uh, during his participation this year uh, at the General Assembly. And again, you'll see uh, evidence of our concerns about this in the document as well as in some of our uh, other uh, discussions at USAID. So let me turn briefly to what is new in the strategy, leaving David to provide much of the de details. First, we have a, a framework that focuses on what we are trying to accomplish rather than the sectors where we are operating. And I would urge folks to look very carefully at the, the page in the uh, strategy that r reflects this shift. Second, we have identified multiple country contexts and described their implications in broad strokes for DRG pr programming. Third, we have introduced new approaches and emphases for addressing uh, DRG issues. And here I'll mention uh, the grand challenges for development um, as a concept, but specifically the one that relates to the work that we're doing in the DRG sector, namely making all voices count. And again, you can see uh, it referenced in the document, uh, as well as our emphasis through uh, USAID Forward and the reform efforts uh, that we've put in place there to emphasize uh, the strengthening of local systems, be they governments, uh, private sector or civil society. Fourth, we have re-emphasized our commitment to analy analytics. Whether it's through the use of an updated version of the DRG assessment tool, a re recognition of the importance of political economy analysis, or our formal adoption of the recommendations that were included in the 2000 National Academies of Science study that reviewed US's, USAID's experience with evaluations. Uh, and again, I think uh, this commitment to analytics will serve us uh, quite well as we move forward uh, in this sphere. And fifth and finally, we recognized uh, in the document the importance of elevating democracy, human rights, and governance within USAID, not only by establishing the center or reestablishing a center of excellence uh, for democracy, human rights, and governance that David heads, but also by committing ourselves to creating other mechanisms to ensure that these issues are taken into account with respect to all we do as an agency. At the same time, I wanted to emphasize what has not changed. <clears throat> we have not established through this uh, strategy a listing of priority countries. If you look at sort of uh, the work we're doing in other initiatives like Feed the Future or Global Health, you'll see a, a very explicit list of these are the countries that you know, are, are being prioritized. We did not do this, that in this strategy. Second, we remain committed to a reliance on country circumstances to set programming rather than Washington setting directives for what our missions should do in particular country contexts. And we have also expressed a willingness to continue funding and supporting politically oriented programs through our work on elections as well as political party and civil society development. And I stress this because I think this historically from way back in the uh, 90s when uh, democracy and governance first was introduced to USAID till today is what distinguishes us from many other uh, development agencies that do work in the broader governance sphere. So let me close with a quick listing of the challenges that I see lying ahead as we move forward towards implementation. First, we have to define more explicitly what constitutes success for us in this sector. Um, we were pushed uh, in developing the strategy, and, and those who were involved uh, remember this debate about whether sh we should have you know, explicit targets for what we would hope to accomplish in two years, three years, four years. And we, we've left that more open-ended than in some of the other strategies, but it's clearly something that we need to think about. Second, we have to continue debating the trade-off between breadth of presence in all countries uh, where our DRG assistance might be helpful versus a more in-depth commitment to specific countries that are ripe for transformation. 
Again, this has been a long-standing debate within USAID. Um, we don't have the answers laid out in this document, uh, but it's something that we need to continue uh, discussing. Third, we need to provide the necessary tools for our staff, and again here I want to compliment the work that's being done in the uh, DRG Center, which is really focusing on this issue of bringing our staff, and not only our DRG staff, but uh, agency staff throughout, up on specific aspects that are uh, referenced in the strategy, uh, as well as the broader issues. And last, and, and here I'll make my uh, pitch that we don't only focus or necessarily focus on budget levels. I mean, we've been holding our own in terms of budget, uh, but we, more important, need to ensure uh, that the commitment that we've made to elevating uh, democracy, human rights, and governance within USAID uh, is maintained. And so I'll stop here and hand it over to David to talk a little bit more about the details of what is in the strategy. But thank you very much for, for the uh, listening and look forward to your questions. Thank you, Larry. Good morning, everybody. Let me add my thanks that Larry conveyed. Thanks to Dan for chairing this important conversation and convening it. Thanks to our fellow panelists for their leadership in the human rights and democratic governance field for many, many decades now. Thanks to the policy task team that formulated this very difficult and challenging uh, document. Thanks very much to all of our USAID colleagues over the decades who for the last two or three decades have implemented the prior strategy and will implement this new one and have created the foundation, a strong foundation for the human rights and democratic governance sector at USAID. And finally, thanks to all of you in the audience our implementing partners, members of civil society, members of the international community, for really being a part, an important part, of the US and international movement for human rights and democratic governance. So I'd like to follow Larry by unpacking, as Dan said, the architecture of the new democracy, human rights, and governance strategy, and speaking a little bit about the details of it. In essence, this is my, policy, this is my elevator speech to all of you on the new strategy and policy. It's a little bit more than the 30 seconds if we were in an elevator together. So picture all of us in the service elevator going up very slowly, the Empire State Building. So I'll try and finish in about 10 minutes. So I have you as a captive audience. I know you're all thinking, why mess around with something that's worked well for 20 years and even longer? Why are you David Young and Larry Garber and Sarah Mendelson messing with success? And so here's what I would say to you in our modest elevator going up this rickety shaft. I would say, listen to what I have to say, because the old, the best of the old is blended with what we believe to be the important parts of the new, addressing the challenges that Larry spoke about in the 21st century. First, let me start in my tour of the architecture with this, the statement of the goal of the strategy, which is, and I quote, I believe, which is to support the establishment and consolidation of inclusive and accountable democracies to advance freedom, dignity, and development. Let me repeat it. To support the establishment and consolidation of inclusive and accountable democracies to advance freedom, dignity, and development. Like any good thesis statement, this goal statement, I believe, provides the outline and key words within the statement of the body of the strategy. And here's what I mean. The adjective inclusive to qualify, describe democracy foreshadows the first objective, which is to create political processes and government institutions that are inclusive, participatory, and representative, what I call for short the inclusive participation objective. Secondly, the descriptor accountable for democracies tells us about our second objective, which is to increase the accountability of leaders and institutions and to make leaders and institutions more accountable to citizens first and foremost and also to the laws of the land. So I underline the phrase to freedom, dignity, and development. The key word here for the third objective on human rights is dignity and I'll get into that in the body of my remarks. The dignity for us represents our embrace of the human rights agenda. And fourth and finally, our fourth objective regards the term development. 
to advance freedom, dignity, and development. Of course, democracy and human rights are an integral part of development. That's stated up front in the preamble of the Busan Declaration on Effective Development Cooperation. We take it as so in USAID. But also we believe, of course, the development writ large embraces the social and economic sectors as well, as well. And so the social and economic sectors and the relationship to democracy, human rights, and governance uh, loom large in our strategy. So as we ride further up the elevator, let's take a close look at each of these four objectives and understand the why, why they were chosen, and the how, very briefly, how we will pursue these four objectives. Let me take the first two together because I believe inclusive participation and accountability are the twin defining characteristics of democracy, of self-rule, de or of democratic governance, however you put it, governance by the people, for the people, and of the people. They are indeed two sides of the same coin. First, participation. Why did we choose inclusive participation as our first strategic objective? It was not, in my view, Alexis de Tocqueville, who was the first great theorist of participation in the context of democracy. No, it was not in the 19th century of a French theorist, but it was a Greek theorist, Aristotle, in the 5th century BC. If you remember, Aristotle, in the preamble of book one of his famous The Politics, talked about humans as political animals. He meant nothing in a Machiavellian sense or a Hobbesian sense in using that term. What he meant is that humans endowed with the gift of language, with the faculty of language, we have the ability as opposed to other animals. Our species alone can use language to reason, and through our reasoning and through our group reasoning, within the political sphere, we can create moral lives, moral communities together. Language, moral reason, politics, community. Indeed, for Aristotle, we are political animals because through political participation, participation in the state, participation in the polis, we, to put it bluntly, fulfill our ultimate humanity. We reach the telos, we reach the end of our of our promise as a species. Therefore, participation has always been for 2,500 years at the heart of democratic theory. We participate because that's how we rule ourselves and because that's how we fulfill our ultimate promise as moral beings. So how are we in AID going to pursue this goal of inclusive participation? In four ways, very briefly. By focusing on how civil society and governments protect the core civil and political rights, meaning the holy trinity, the freedom to speak, to assemble, to associate. We will support the advancement of these core civil and political rights. Second, we will support the agents of participation, individual citizens themselves, through civic education, civic participation, through civil society organizations of whatever stripe, including the labor community, business associations, free and independent media, and of course in the formal political sphere, political parties. Those agents of political participation we will continue to support as we have all supported. We will thirdly pursue participation by supporting participatory processes within the state itself. Participation doesn't end with an election campaign, but participation is embedded in healthy states within state institutions themselves, within local governments, through the participation of citizens in local government, in local forums, through parliaments who reach out in a robust and compelling way to their constituents. In these ways, we will support participatory processes within the state. And finally, we will support fair, the creation of fair and impartial laws and policies that the state creates. This is where our historic and traditional support for the rule of law in every stripe comes in, and our, our broad governance portfolio as well, helping institutions of the state. We will help them for a particular purpose in this sense, to create a fair and equal playing field so citizens can participate in electing the state, in creating the state, and in participating in the state as established. So our second objective, accountability, the accountability of institutions of government and leaders to citizens and to the law. Why? 
Well, if Aristotle was a theorist of participation and democratic participation, John Locke, of course, was the theorist of accountability. We lose, we, we leave the state of nature because our, our inalienable rights, as he put it, of life, liberty, and property cannot be well preserved, safely preserved in the state of nature, the pre-government existence that we were all found ourselves in historically. So we choose to be in the state, to create a state of our own making so we can rule ourselves and the government serve us. So that the government serves us and the government is accountable to us, the citizens. And Locke famously said, which was echoed through Thomas Paine and Jefferson and others of the founders of our nation, said that if governments are not accountable, they need to be changed, the people in them need to be changed, or the government itself needs to be changed. So Locke and Paine and Jefferson and that whole crew of founding fathers and mothers, we owe to them the, 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 the heritage of accountability and democracy and democratic governance. How will we pursue accountability? The strategy says in four ways. And political scientists like uh, Larry Diamond would put it this way. The first two ways we believe in vertical accountability. That is from the bottom up, citizens making governments accountable through their own activities. First and foremost, through free and fair elections and everything about elections, including electoral administration, electoral observation, electoral oversight. And the other second form of vertical accountability will be through civil society organizations, through media oversight of the government across all of its institutions. The third basket of accountability mechanisms we will support will be horizontal mechanisms. Again, rule of law looms large. Constitutions loom large. State institutions have to abide by the, the planks of a constitution. And the legal code looms large. Also what looms large in this basket of accountability, horizontal accountability, is the checks and balances among state institutions. And independence of the judiciary is crucial. Judicial oversight of a parliament or of the executive branch. Legislative, parliamentary oversight of executive ministries and the executive himself or herself and intra-executive mechanisms, such as auditing or ombud person offices. And finally, and more broadly, we will pursue accountability by enabling and capacitating the state itself. We will support the state in all its manifestations to fulfill its public trust and to provide and fulfill the promise that it will provide adequate public goods and services to its citizens. We will do this through supporting ethical codes and ethical training, through public administration, through decentralization efforts that brings effective local governance to local communities, through economic governance, etc. The third objective, human rights. Why human rights? Isn't that something that the State Department does in the name and shame game that diplomats and pinstripe soups do since Jimmy Carter and Congress founded the Bureau for Democracy, Human Rights, Labor in 1976. Why sully the profession of development by name and shame? We believe human rights, because human rights are emblematic of human dignity, belong front and center on a 21st century US development agenda. Human rights, indeed, transcend political freedom. If democracy characterizes freedom in our phrase, advance freedom, dignity, and development, then human rights, human dignity characterizes human rights. We are born with inalienable rights as enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Human rights and the expression and our empowerment of those rights literally provides us with dignity, a dignified life. If you ask Mohammed Bouazizi, the now famous vegetable seller who set himself aflame in the, in the markets and the squares of Tunis, was he fighting for democracy or human rights? I think he would have said in the face of daily insults and pulling away of his license to ply his trade, he would say, I'm simply fighting for my dignity. So in honor of Mohammed Bouazizi, we embrace the human rights agenda. We take this to mean three things. 
at its core, the security of the person, the freedom from violations of physical integrity, freedom from the state employing murder, torture, unlawful detention to pursue its goals, freedom from the modern scourge of trafficking in persons, our modern version of slavery, security of the person. Second, we take human rights to mean the core civil and political liberties as enshrined in the Universal Declaration. Again, the Holy Trinity, the freedom to speak, to assemble, to associate. And finally, and most importantly, I think in terms of its innovation and through the leadership of human rights leaders like uh, Chloe Schwenke, we're indebted to her for putting on the agenda of USAID human rights as the equality of opportunity, as equal access to government services, to justice, to social services, equality of opportunity so all are included in the provisions of the state. AID has always pursued these goals. We've, we're making human rights explicit and elevated now because we want to join the international movement that puts the principles of human rights as expressed in the Universal Declaration as the foundation of its work in democratic governance. This, surprisingly to an American audience, makes us part of the international movement in a way that democracy itself does not. If the French keep reminding us, pointedly often, it's about human rights in the body and the international consensus on human rights and not democracy with a capital D that forms the international consensus. We believe both and we believe this elevation of human rights brings us part of that international movement. Very briefly, we'll promote human rights in three ways. Through protection, through prevention and promotion, we will support many activities across these three activities helping human rights defenders, supporting the rule of law, supporting transitional justice, human rights commission, working on atrocity prevention, training of media, making laws and legal code align with international human rights principles. And finally, let me say about human rights and about this rights-based approach or inclusion approach, we take very seriously the concept and the practice of inclusive development at USAID. Inclusive development means that any formally disenfranchised population, whether it be women or girls or ethnic or religious minorities or indigenous peoples or members of the LGBT community or the disabled persons community, we will promote their political and civil rights and we will work towards including them in the work of all of our social and economic sectors as well. Which brings me to the fourth and final objective of integration. We will advance development outcomes by integrating democracy, human rights, and governments across the fabric of USAID's development portfolio. Now this may sound like a grandiose topic, but we believe it represents best practice of the year 2013 and that we're catching up to many other donor agencies in stating this goal. There are obvious obstacles in the views of an expert community like this here today. There are obstacles to the advancement of socio and economic development, whether it be health or environmental protection or food security or economic growth. These don't advance in our own society or other societies, not simply because we lack the capacity or technical skills to carry them out, but because there are deep political and economic, political economy, if you will, obstacles towards their advancement. To put it bluntly, dysfunctional political economy stymie political as well as social and economic development. We've always taken this view within the democracy, human rights, and governance sector in the assessment tool that Jerry Hyman, who's at CSIS now, pioneered. Political economy is always part of our analysis of the political sphere. Now we're taking that analysis and lending it to the socio and economic sphere of our agency. We believe that through the infusion and integration of democracy, human rights, and governance principles into our social and economic uh, development practices, we can make more progress. But at the same time, and I underline at the same time, we believe we are expanding inclusion, participation, and accountability in our own core democracy, human rights, and governance goals through this integration. We are expanding the sphere of citizenship 
into pocketbook issues, if you will. Democracy, human rights, and government is not just about promoting core holy trinity rights. It's about promoting our social advancement and our economic rights as well. It's about social and economic equality and using political reform and political mobilization tools to effect that change. We will do so. We will promote inclusive, we'll, we will promote the integration of de democracy and rights and governance into our uh, portfolio of socioeconomic portfolio by embracing the first three objectives, by embracing inclusive participation, by embracing accountability, and by embracing a human rights-based approach of equal opportunity towards the services of the state. So in a sense, we are wrapping up the first three objectives and putting them and transporting them and working with our, our, our colleagues in the other sectors to promote them. So let me summarize. Our strategy is this as we reach the top floor of the Empire State Building. We strive for democracies that are marked by inclusive participation and accountability. We strive for democracies that embody universal principles of human rights. And we strive for democracies that extend citizenship and accountability beyond the formal political sector and take it to the economic and social aspects of our lives as well. So in these basic ways, we believe that this strategy of 2013 and into 2014 represents a reformulation of the best of the old of 1994 and takes us strongly with all of your support into the new century and supporting this very important international movement. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. Thank you. That's a very tall building. So <laughs> please, please, there's some folks standing in the back. If you guys, there's a number of seats up here up front in case, uh, I, I do like to say we have standing room only. That is great, but it's not so fun for the folks that are doing the standing room part of it. So if you want to come sit up front, there's about 10 seats up front. And since we're all friends here, you can all, you can feel free to do so and, and don't be shy. Uh, we're going to move to the panel. Uh, uh, reacting to the, to the conversation we've just heard, the presentations we've just heard, reacting to the strategy, providing their perspective on this. I'm going to ask my friend Jennifer Windsor, who is the former director of Freedom House. It's great to see you. Thank you for coming, Jennifer. No problem. Um, I'm hoping you're going to take us back and remind us a little bit of, take us back a little bit, but also uh, thinking about when the Democracy Center was stood up. I'm, but I'm also thinking about some of the hostile environments where AID is working today, Russia, or used to be, I guess we've been kicked out of there, but Belarus, Venezuela somewhat, um, number of farcical democratic rituals going on in a number of these countries, uh, have making it more difficult for US groups to work. This was mentioned by, um, by Larry in his comments. Um, and I also know, um, I'd be curious about what you think about the strategy and what your take is on the concept of integration in the strategy. It's, I didn't, you weren't here for this, but it's karaoke night at CSIS and we have to pass the mic. The good news is we have a new building. The bad news is we're still working out the loose ends on the, the AV. I, I, I will be singing back up, that's right. So I'm gonna pass the mic over, so just bear with me. Great, it's great to be here and um, with all of my friends. Um, and I had, uh, we had planned this ahead of time, and you know, usually with these panels, uh, the panelists get to spring on the presenters their criticisms and concerns, but the way Dan set up, he made us all go around and explain what our issues were, and then we gave Larry and David the chance to give extraordinary presentations that addressed all of the concerns that we had hoped that we would really get them on. Um, but I'm gonna try to, um, but really you both did an excellent job and I wanna congratulate um, you know, those people within the agency, those people that have been working on democracy issues, that have been working on this strategy. Um, I know the group that, um, that had worked on this strategy did a lot, a lot of work. And even the fact that there is a DG strategy is quite now in 2013 is quite a, um, accomplishment, because looking back on the history, um, the fact that there wasn't an, another blessed US aid strategy at that level on democracy was not for lack of trying, 
um, by the democracy folks within the agency. It was really blocked um, by different elements within the agency. So the fact that you got it through it all, even if you had to make compromises, I think is a signature achievement. So, um, so uh, my mandate as Dan said, is well, it was actually, it just expands all the time. So, um, is how this strategy fits into the historical evolution of strategic thinking within USAID about democracy and governance to discuss strengths and concerns about the strategy and identify what I think is missing and raise issues about sort of the next step, which is really implementing all the great things that are here. So, um, I think it's an important um, contribution to what really is an was an evolving strategic thinking within the agency about how, why it does democracy work as part of its development mandate and how it's do, going to do that work. So, um, you know, I also think it's important to even turn back from um, 1994 to say that as much as, you know, it's useful for me and Larry and others to say the Clinton administration is the one that really put this on the table um, and AID. Uh, it was certainly elevated and um, by Brian Atwood and institutionalized with the establishment of the DG Center, which was a center of excellence. It was demoted then into a center of mediocrity, an office of mediocrity. And I'm glad it's back to being a center of excellence again. Um, uh, I, I'm, you know, I don't know what was needed to make that happen. Um, so I, I made the mistake of going through, I have, this, I have these file cabinets that I keep old papers on and, you know, in aid, I got rid of a lot of things when I left aid and I'm sure I violated some aid rules, but I kept a lot of Tuesday group notes and internal policy memos and just retreats in the democracy center all these documents and they go back to, so of course what happens, I stayed up to like midnight last night reading all of this thinking, God, I've got to write that book about what really happened, but that hasn't happened yet. Um, so, you know, it's important to actually think about where democracy started with the Kissinger Commission report on Central America in the 1980s, with Congress mandating that USAID actually support civic groups and the anti-apartheid struggle in South Africa. Um, when I came into the agency in 1991, the prevailing document was the 1990 Democracy Initiative. There's a lot of good stuff in that initiative. I tried to Google it and find it online. I had this old um, paper copy of it. Can't find it, so I hope it's somewhere and in the agency documents. It's, it's worth rereading because actually um, it, it has a lot of great stuff, as does the Democracy and Governance <laughs> Policy paper of 1991. So, um, one of the things that uh, that this um, this strategy does is talk about the integration of democracy and governance into throughout the development work to try to actually address the stovepipes that have plagued USAID for years and years. Um, this need for integration across the other sectors in USAID's work was recognized in way in the early 90s. So the 1991 policy paper said that, reiterated the point that politics is a development issues. In most developing societies, the character of social, economic, and political institutions and values are key constraints to sustained, broadly based economic growth and expanded opportunity. But the early democracy advocates within the agency recognized that there was going to be resistance to the incorporation of democracy into the development. Realm. So 1990 paper states that changing the way in which USAID officers approach their jobs and bringing the linkage between democracy and economic development to the heart of our work will be the most enduring long-term contribution of this initiative. It's important to say that, so that I think democracy officers have always recognized that this integration is important. And the reason why integration has not happened was not because democracy officers did not think it was important. And so this reiteration by the agency in the policy realm that democracy integration is, integration of democracy into other sectors is important is very welcome. But the failure has always been one of implementation, of incentives, both positive, this is a really big priority, 
should, it, should a, Administrator Shaw should say, this has to be done in the guidance to go to missions on their strategies. This shouldn't be a list of like 500 different things they should take into consideration. This has to be endorsed by the very top of the agency. And frankly, those missions, those sectors that did not do that, do not take that into consideration, they have to actually have negative incentives. They need to be called onto the carpet. PPC used to do that kind of strategy review. Is the agency willing to use the policy review process and the strategy review process to actually make this happen? Because otherwise, it's just going to be the DRG Center offering its services and looking for all comers. And what would be the worst outcome would be under budget constraints. For instance, in Albania, I've heard that there was reductions in the budget. So what happened? There was a democracy sector uh, objective and a health objective. And the health objective wanted to continue so the democracy program became a health program but it still used democracy dollars that is not the outcome we want to see there's too few dg dollars and if this is what that means is that dg scarce dg dollars that can barely cover that do not cover actually the needs in the core elements of democracy and human rights and good governance are siphoned off to help those areas that frankly are more well endowed because they've got earmarks is something that I think uh, really needs to be ta taken uh, seriously. Um, I welcome the elevation of human rights within this new strategy. Um, you know, human rights was always a part of uh, USAID's work, and if you look in the early 1990 documents, uh, they identified, the 1991 document identified human rights as one of the four goals of of USAID's democracy's work. And while missions have had programs to support elements of human rights, I mean, I think particularly and to treat human rights abuses, I think Latin America has a long history of this. It's no, it's, there's no um, uh, dispute that the strategic thrust has been about preventing abuses through as kind of a secondary objective of improving democratic processes and in institutions. So the idea of prevention, treatment, um, putting human rights at the center, I think, is a very important contribution. Now, I know, um, because I love to get into what's been removed, that there was a lot of language about human rights that was removed from the document. And I would love to have Larry explain why that was the case, just because I want to put him on the, um, on the stump. Because this assault on human rights right now um, is most manifested on the backlash against civil society. And I very much welcome the strategy's um, emphasis on civil society. Um, but I, I want to talk about what Dan said, which is we are facing an unprecedented backlash, not only against the local groups, which are very important, that are very, that are, you're seeing, you know, you just, just talk to, um, just look at any ICNL document or talk to Doug Rutzen. In country after country after country, we're seeing laws being put in place that say that civil society needs to be restricted in X, X, X ways, and that certainly foreign organizations and foreign funding should be constrained. And I just wonder, you know, we've seen the challenge in Egypt, in UAE, in Bahrain, in Bolivia, in Russia, and I don't know if this is USAID's um, you know, call, it's really the administration's call, it's the State Department, which is how much are they going to care if the government says shut down your DG program, which they did, by the way, in Bolivia, and USAID and state said, okay, we'll, we'll jettison that so we can keep our other objectives. Um, you know, we're, Rwanda doesn't actually respect the human rights of its citizens, nor guarantee democratic processes, nor does Ethiopia. They get huge amounts of resources and are the darlings in the broader development community. What, is that, um, what does that mean in terms of the political will to actually make democracy and human rights concerns an essential, a central part in how USAID does all of its work? I'd like to see more. I always do. Um, so finally, you know, what I hoped to find in the document and what I hoped I would hear the administrator say 
is that he was interested in elevating DRG both by making some structural changes and by making resource changes. I have never been a fan, and nor has anybody been surprised, after um, the Global Bureau was dismantled and the Democracy Center was demoted to be an office and stuck under Dacha. And frankly, always pushed to the side by humanitarian crises and conflict. Democracy and human rights and good governance are part of our conflict work. But there are a lot of issues out there that have nothing to do with conflict. And to the extent that you do not have an individual reporting directly to the administrator, empowered by the administrator to serve as a spokesperson for democracy and human rights and good governance, I think that this strategy will not be implemented. And I looked at the implementation guidelines and all the things that everybody's supposed to do, and I said, blah, 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 blah. I want to see where, you know, that can mean nothing doesn't have. This should be an office reporting directly to the administrator, and this administrator has to do a lot more in saying that democracy matters. And the first strategy rollout that this was done for this strategy, he never even mentioned the word democracy in his introduction. I don't know if somebody hadn't briefed him properly that that's what his role was. He talked about poverty. He may be stuck in the word governance, but he didn't talk about democracy. We need the administrator talking about democracy. That's when we made real progress in USAID, is when Brian Atwood cared about it and stated again and again. So, um, and then the last thing is resources. Larry said we've been doing okay on resources. Not if you scratch underneath the surface, not if you don't, if you take off Iraq and Afghanistan and Sudan and these crisis countries, not if you look at the smaller countries in Africa, which have always been underfunded, the diminishing resources that are going to Eastern Europe, Eurasia, despite dramatic setbacks in those countries. USAID does not have the resources to to really tackle the challenges today. And I would hope that in the impl implementation of this, that we can get more resources because we've always been the sector that has to squeeze past all the other administration initiatives or um, earmarked uh, sectors. So um, with that, um, good job on the strategy and uh, challenges for the future. Thank you, Jennifer. I I'm always grateful for your candor, and I, I saw everybody wake up and follow with, with great interest what you had to say, so thank you very, very much. You, mission accomplished, thank you. <laughs> exactly. Well, exactly. Well, Bill, um, thank you for being with us today. I'm hoping you're going to you're you're with IFIS. Um, uh, I'm hoping you're going to talk about the how we ensure the centrality of contested elections. How do you do that in the context of uh, a growing number of, of as I call them farcical democracies? Um, what do you think about the strategy? Over to you. Uh, thanks, Dan. Uh, first, for the opening opportunity on farcical democracies. Um, uh, having been outside of the country for most of the shutdown, I would not want to share with uh, all of you uh, what representatives of farcical democracies were sharing with me as to the efficacy of our 237-year-old experiment in, in governance. Um, uh, it was a, a humbling experience in a number of different countries. Uh, is the easiest way to put it. Um, but first of all, uh, th thanks to uh, USAID and David and Larry for uh, a really terrific strategy document. Uh, it is substantive, it is critical, it is nuanced, it is really quite rich. Um, thanks to the shutdown, uh, we were had this uh, postponed, which meant that Larry and I had one or two private exchanges, which meant that uh, thanks to airplanes, I actually read this government document a few times. And uh, the more you read it, the more you realize uh, how much and how intense the debate was and uh, how some of the language and some of uh, the references are very all-encompassing to interesting uh, currents of thought which have emerged since the original document in 1994. And I, just to refer to two, uh, the spectrum of fragility, a great concept and explained in, de in depth, as well as democratic backsliding, uh, all 
progress in this is not exactly linear, uh, which is hard for many people who are uh, goal-oriented and results-oriented to anticipate, expect, and deal with. Now, IFAS is very, very old-fashioned. We work with election management bodies to try and conduct free, fair, transparent elections that the losers actually accept as being credible in their societies. Uh, the only way I've discovered uh, to get to a democratic society is through this old-fashioned thing called the ballot box. And ballot boxes aren't exactly new or sexy or very interesting, although they can mean dramatic changes to countries. In Egypt, ballot boxes were these wonderful things made with glass sides that you couldn't transport by truck, and when the glass broke, they put cardboard in there, so everyone trusted how their vote uh, was going to be freely counted and uh, that it, the vote had some integrity. And in Miramar, where I just returned, uh, they have cardboard ballot boxes that occasionally they seal with scotch tape. So we're talking with the Union Election Commission about a substantive improvement in something not very old, not very sexy, not very interesting, but will send a message to the citizens as they vote that the process is different and will send a message to the political party and civil society observers as well as the news media that there is in some integrity to the process of putting that piece of paper in the box and know that that box wasn't tampered with until it was officially opened in front of everyone to be counted, one vote at a time. And that's always the danger to um, all of us practitioners who have been doing good work since 1994 or earlier with a new strategy. Because all agencies, all administrations, uh, all parts of government tend to go into what I call the magpie theory looking for something new and shiny to put in the nest and ignore the parts of the process that were old-fashioned, that don't necessarily attract attention, but do build the type of nest that you need in order to raise a society, raise your young. I'm not going to carry this much further, believe me. <laughs> but the point is, the point is, the point is that, you know, when you're reading one of these documents, you're looking for the fundamentals. And are the fundamentals still there? Now, as an advocate of fundamentals, I will say, oh, well, they're there, but they're not there often enough, and they're not there early enough, and they haven't been repeated often enough. And there's some truth to that. Uh, the word elections doesn't appear till page 17. And when you're talking about democracy and governance, maybe elections have a little bit more prominence than showing up somewhere on page 17. However, at the same time, I'm going to give credit to the authors, uh, the fundamentals are very expressly written that there is a commitment to an ongoing competitive political process and there is a commitment to free and fair administration of elections. And many of the words that received much more detail in earlier strategies are not uh, new and sexy are not expansive, but are part of the framework, are part of the fundamentals, are part of the construction going forward. So I, I suspect that the more you, you know, uh, words matter and deeds matter. And the more we look at the strategy, the strategy encompasses the progress that we've made. Um, as a group of providers of assistance, as a group of advocates in this space. Now, there's always going to be the fear that the new is going to somehow or other attract more resources, more attention than the established. And I think th that fear is the responsibility of everyone who's an advocate or involved in providing services to raise and, and justifiably raise. And it's the responsibility of the authors to justifiably say, yes, but, or yes, we've got that base covered, or things have moved on one way or the other and deal with it uh, in a straightforward fashion. Uh, th three final comments. Number one, I applaud, uh, I really do, the um, magnificent way that human rights is integrated so fully into strategy. In many societies that we work in, 
the question of human rights, the question of gender rights, the question of uh, historically discriminated uh, populations, the question of the disabled, are things which in the 21st century you'd be surprised how open people are to trying to, uh, particularly uh, in my case, election administrators. Election administrators understand that their job is to try and get 100% turnout. And in many of their societies, that means they've got to do things that are very contrary to the politics and the culture of the society to enable 50% of the population to participate who are women, or enable historically discriminated groups, particularly the disabled, to participate because their families have hidden them for years or they're not in secure areas. So the constant theming on human rights as central to this strategy is what I think the United States is all about, and I compliment the authors of the strategy for weaving it in so fully. Secondly, the closing political space argument applies not just to domestic organizations, it also applies to international organizations, and it also applies particularly to the financing of organizations and political parties. And if anything, um, I think the fact that international presence has been, uh, the, 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 the bad guys, if you will, are sharing lessons learned on questions of registration and campaign finance and other issue and labor law, and those are making it more and more difficult for the international community to participate either directly or indirectly or financially, and I think that issue is, a, is an addition to the strategy. And the final point I'm going to make is, is on technology. Um, I spent 18 years in the technology business before I joined uh, IFAS as president. And my concern is that in many of the countries we work in, technology is really cool because you can count it, and it's located in the center cities, and it's done by the educated elite, not the people who are on $2 a day and illiterate and in the rural areas. And the real test of the legitimacy of the governance process is going to be whether or not it gets out and develops the entire country. And this is particularly true in terms of economic issues like land reform and the extractive minerals issues. And um, I, I have some concern that, that we're almost institutionalizing uh, a digital divide in these societies, particularly with our development assistance focused on different tools which sometimes work. And social media is great for building a crowd, but it's real hard to drive a party platform or recruit candidates for office um, or, or get some of the other hard work of democracy and governance done. And those are questions that, that you know, again, I'll, I'll start, end off with my magpie point, new, shiny, easy to count, in the cities, educated, people like us, using Western technology, but does it get to the hidden majorities in these countries that are under $2 a day who, um, whose vote counts just as much as the college graduate in Islamabad? So with that, thank you. Thanks, Bill. Jim, um, you're a former acting deputy administrator. You also were the assistant administrator for the Asian Near East Bureau. You uh, had to think about issues such as balancing democracy rights and governance issues with other competing priorities, uh, strategic, strategic relationships with the United States. Um, I think about the Middle East before the Arab Spring. You also you know, covered China. Um, you know, take us back a few years to think about you know, how some context in, in that region, but also think about the challenges of integrating democracy rights and governance in the, in the context of other competing priorities. Thank you, Dan. Uh, congratulations to CSIS on this wonderful new facility. Let me uh, share with you the same thing I shared with my panelists. If I'm, if I'm less than uh, my normal acute self in my analysis, because I just flew in from Kabul yesterday. In fact, I was, as I was drifting in and out of sentience here, and I heard uh, <coughs> David uh, talk about Aristotle for a moment, I flashed back when I was in an undergraduate political science class or something. Uh, let, me, let me follow a pretty much standard uh, format. Let me, let me, and, and also let me be quick, uh, so because I know this, I just recognize a lot of folks, and 
awful lot of expertise out there in the audience, and I, I know you want to get involved in this as well. Uh, let me give you a couple of things that I think are real high points, real positive things about the strategy, and then get into, based on my experience in, in the part of the world I managed for USAID, get into some of what I think are the both conceptual and implement, uh, implementation challenges, and I'll make that a very short list and just try to highlight them briefly. Uh, first of all, uh, I, I, what, what's a strategy? I mean, to me, a good strategy is something that tells me what I'm supposed to do Monday morning, right? I mean, generally, what I'm supposed to do, my part of it might be this, my part of it might be that, but I should know where I'm heading. And I thought all in all, although there are an awful lot of things, as Bill said, packed in here, I think the emphasis on democracy it's a bold statement. You know, there are a lot of things we could focus on. We could focus on governance. We could focus on, you know, uh, good institutions, service delivery. But it's a bold statement. Uh, we're focused on democracy. That's a, a good place to start. There's an outcomes orientation, which I think is critically important. The integration with other sectors that a number of the speakers have touched on, critically important. Uh, I personally was very excited to see the uh, elements in there about a political economy analysis. This is a weak point for USAID. We've got a lot of brilliant folks. We've got a lot of great technical expertise. But people don't always think in terms of a political economy analysis when we're doing development work around the world, and especially the focus on elites. I mean, it may be a, a fairly obvious statement that, you know, there are embedded elites in each of the countries in which we will be working, and they've got a stake in the system, no matter how damaged the system might be. And starting off with that kind of political economy analysis, if we can pull it off, would, would really be an important step forward. So I think there are some very, very strong, uh, useful things about this strategy. Now, let me give you what I think are a couple of the conceptual and implementation uh, challenges, and I've just got four. Uh, the first one is on the global-local axis, the global-local axis. I, I think there are two uh, challenges there. Uh, number one, we, the, the, the strategy says we're going to implement at the country level. But inherently, these are global principles of democracy, human rights. Uh, so, so, and we say we're going to start off with democracy, but we're going to implement this in the country context. I think that's a challenge, and I think it's especially a challenge aligned with the USAID forward local leadership perspective. Uh, I was at a conference uh, last year in Brussels uh, co uh, when I was at the German Marshall Fund, uh, co-sponsored by the German Marshall Fund and the European Union, and it was bringing in a bunch of Chinese scholars, both from within the government, uh, development scholars, both from within the government and in private sector uh, organizations in China. And they, they gave us a very profound challenge, which was as we fell into our normal mode and hectored the them about just building infrastructure in Africa, then not paying attention to gender issues and human rights, our standard Western spiel, right? They gave us a quizzical look and said, but, but we read the Paris Declaration. You told us to read the Paris Declaration, and we asked the local people what they wanted, and they said they wanted ports and bridges, and they were tired of being lectured by outside experts on systems of governance. Now, I mean, I don't fully agree with that argument, but it's a profound challenge. How do we, in the current development context, continue to implement global principles, but do it at the country level and pay attention to the Paris Declaration and USAID forward simultaneously? Okay, first conceptual challenge. A second one is, okay, it's the elephant in the room. We all know it's there. But I, I'll tell you what I shared with our, my colleagues before the session. Egypt lands like a thud in the middle of this, right? I mean, we're going to focus on democracy, but throughout the paper, throughout the strategy, we also use words like security and stability. And, and I, you know, my colleagues from aid know this better than I do. They're going to have to work within the real world. You're going to have to talk to the ambassador about this. We're going to have to talk to the assistant secretaries of state about this, national security staff. But this is a profound implementation challenge to make this bold statement about democracy as the uh, primer inter pares, the first among equals, 
and then recognize that we have to pay attention uh, to democracy. Look, I mean, we talk about what are some of the challenges to human rights in this strategy. The, the strategy itself talks about uh, narco-trafficking and terrorism and religious extremism. And the brutal reality, certainly in the part of the world that I managed, is that sometimes the best governance leaders and the governance structures to take on terrorism and narco-trafficking uh, and, and extremism uh, are autocratic. People who know how to run militaries, people who know how to run police forces. So how, how do we square that? It's a deep, deep conceptual challenge. Obvious one, but a, a, a deep one. Uh, third is on the um, resources and training stuff. I went to the, uh, for the first time in my life, I went to the USAID dashboard to see how much uh, USAID says they're spending on democracy and governance. And at least as my reading, it came out to about 14%. Uh, I don't know, the, the, the paper talks about more resources, but I would say as much as the dollar resources are a challenge, the training resources are a challenge. How do we get USAID staff, by and large, to do serious political economy analysis when they're not trained in that area? How do we, human rights, uh, human rights operationalization, implementation, requires some very specific skill sets protection, sometimes evacuation, secure data systems that allow you to deal with those who are being oppressed in a given society. Are we going to invest in the kinds of things that UNHCR has invested in in the past or the UN human rights folks? That's, it's, a, it's a dollar resource and a training resource implementation challenge. And finally, uh, final implementation challenge is, is the USAID system itself. I mean, I know uh, my former colleagues, they are past masters at taking the latest implementation directive from Washington and doing exactly what they want to do. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a former mission director I know very well used to tell me that, uh, you know, I like to do irrigation work. <laughs> and, you know, when the, when the directives came in from Washington to emphasize gender, I just rewrote it as the, you know, women-centric irrigation project. And then when they told me to do private sector, then it became the private sector irrigation project. I, I mean, uh, you know, it is uh, the exact right thing to say, in, in my humble point of view, that we need to integrate these profoundly important principles into the rest of USAID's work. But uh, it, is a, it is a real challenge to get the aid staff to buy into this, and I agree completely with what Jennifer said earlier. I saw all the right things at the end about leadership, but there's an awful lot of shoulds. They should do this and they should do that, and, and you will, I think, face a profound implementation challenge on, on making this stick. So those are my comments. Thanks, Jim. I'm going to give both of you guys a chance to respond to my, my friends over here to my left. Uh, assume it's a 20-floor building uh, in terms of your response, because I want to get uh, some of the folks out in the audience a chance to, to ask some questions. But I suspect there's several things that jumped out at, from, from our friends on the panel here that you may want to just respond to immediately before we get into the Q&A. So I'll give you each a chance. But think 20 floors, not 200 floors. Okay, I'll go first. So um, first of all, thanks for, for reading the strategy so carefully at first, because that's, I think, the, you know, the biggest fear when you uh, invest the time to do a strategy like this is that you know, it just becomes a, a uh, document that sits on the, the shelf. And, and clearly we want not only our staff, uh, our colleagues within USAID, but our partners uh, to read it and, and to have discussions like the one we're having today. So let me just pick up on three points that uh, our, our panelists made. Uh, there are lots of other issues, but uh, hopefully some of them will come out in the, uh, in the discussion. First of all, you know, on the uh, closing space, I mean, we did take that very seriously. It's in the document. Um, but more than it, that it's in the document, it is something that we at USAID, in addition to be p being part of the interagency process, have sought to make part of how we think about, you know, how our, our field missions are thinking about addressing these issues. And uh, a few months back, we, we sent out a cable uh, to our uh, staff 
you know, uh, mission directors, uh, DRG officers, others, you know, instructing them on how we want them to think about what we see as a really serious issue in this space. And we're continuing this work. Um, Sarah Mendelson this week is in London at the uh, Open Partnership, uh, Open Government and Partnership, OPG, where, where this issue of closing space is on the agenda. And so it is something that we are taking very seriously. And again, it's, it's not just USAID, it's not just the US government, but it really is something that we need to be, uh, as a, a broader community, looking at very carefully. Second, um, Jim raised the issue, and, and, and for me it's particularly profound because, you know, Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays I'm focused on DRG issues, and Tuesday and Thursday I'm focused on implementing the uh, USAID Forward uh, dictate on how do we more effectively um, work with host country institutions. And, um, you know, hopefully, you know, uh, by the weekend I'm, I'm not totally confused on how on how I've a bit managed to balance it. But I really do see these as, as important to bring together. And so you're right to pose it as a challenge. Uh, but we have been thinking about, first of all, when we talk about local systems, it's not the government to government only. It really does include the private sector and civil society. And we've been reinforcing that over and over again. But it also includes being more political about how we think of working with host country institutions and strengthening those host country institutions. So the political economy analysis that we're talking about is really embedded into our efforts to understand and map the local systems um, that we, we need to strengthen. Because without strengthening these local systems, we're gonna be doing this work over and over again. And again, I think you're, you know, experience probably this week in Kabul reinforce that, uh, but more generally, um, we need to be thinking about sustainability uh, throughout our work and, and, and including in the way we do democracy, human rights, and governance work. And then the last issue, which is a little more sensitive, uh, but I do feel obliged to respond to uh, my good friend Jennifer's comments. Um, you know, we were incredibly fortunate in the 1990s, and, and certainly Jennifer, David, and I you know, personally benefited from having someone like Brian Atwood as the administrator of the agency at a time when we were profoundly looking to transform w the way we thought about uh, development to include uh, democracy and governance. And, and, you know, he came from uh, this background. Raj Shah clearly does not come from this background. And he, he doesn't, you know, talk about it as, as eloquently or as fluently as, as someone like Brian uh, did. But I think, w and, and you, know, we, you know, we were lucky to have someone like Brian. Most development agencies have never had a person who came out of a, a, a democracy promotion background as the head of a development agency. So we shouldn't necessarily expect, um, you know, that Jennifer Windsor is going to be the next USAID administrator. My <laughs> She's got my vote. It would be great if she were, but 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 the point is the the challenge for someone like Raj and for us working is is he giving us the space to be able to put forward this agenda in a serious way? And I think by allowing us to develop the strategy in the way that it has evolved, by um, creating or recreating the the center of excellence on democracy human rights and governance. And again, it sounds bureaucratic going from an office to a center, but it, you know, for those of you who've been in the bureaucracy, it actually is significant, believe it or not. By committing the resources that we have to doing some of the fundamental analytic work, to doing the training work that, that um, Jim was referencing, and not just, as I said, for the democracy cadre, but for a broader cadre, um, he is giving us the space, and he is allowing us to ensure that in the uh, interagency uh, discussions, when USAID is present, that we are empowered to speak about these issues, not just the narrow, um, you know, more narrow humanitarian or development issues, but that we have a voice. And, and we, again, we were very fortunate uh, for several years to have as our deputy administrator, Don Steinberg, who clearly in the interagency was the voice on some of the core human rights issues. And, and so again, you know, 
sure, we'd love Raj to talk more uh, about democracy, human rights, and governance, but I think the most important is is, 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 is is there space for us to do the work? And I believe he's given us that space and we need to effectively take advantage of it. I can do this. Yeah, yeah, Hi. sorry. Yes. Yeah. Just a few comments on some of the excellent points that were made by our panelists. One on the resources issue. Let me confront it directly on resources and integration. I agree completely with Jennifer, agree with Gen Jennifer's concerns. First, a conceptual point. The core work, the traditional work in democracy, human rights, and governance needs to continue. The integrated work of democracy, human rights, and governance into the social and economic sectors cannot succeed, I underline cannot succeed, without that core work continuing. The expansion of citizenship and accountability mechanisms into the other sectors will only work if the core institutions, both at the national and local level, are built with our support and the support of other donors. On integration resources, so given that conceptual point, the budget point is that we will seek resources from other sectors to help us do the democracy, human rights, and governance work in those sectors. We will not take the scarce resources from our own sector to do it. That, that's certainly our goal. On resources overall, we'd always like more money. Um, the data shows, I was on foreignassistance.gov yesterday to get the most recent data. From 2009 to 2012, the budget has stayed between 1.6 billion, rising up to most recently about 2.1 billion. It stayed statically at 11 or 12 percent of USAID's overall budget. In some regions, we've hit, been hit hard, not by cuts, but with, by competing priorities, particularly in Africa. We need to fight, continue to fight, and make the case with all of you together for continuing uh, core budget as well as uh, um, expansion of integrated activities. I'll just say we appreciate uh, Bill's warning on the technological divide, but let me. Um, I think Dan's eager to move on, so let me leave it at that budget. Point. We've reached the top of the building. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to open it up. There are a lot of smart and thoughtful people. I'm going to call on John Sullivan, my friend Nancy in the back, and then let's see. There's a there's a woman back there. So, uh, John, right? Mary Kate, come here, right here, right here, right. Then we're going to speak to Nancy, and then this woman. That, that raised your hand, you, yep, you waved, that's it, the three of you. We're gonna do this World Bank style, we'll group them together, okay. Okay. And everyone gets extra credit for name, organization, and brief question, okay, yeah. Well, I'll get two out of three. John Sullivan, Center for International Private Enterprise. Forgive me for riding my hobby horse, but it brought me over here, so I have to bring it up. And I come back to this point about economic growth and democratic governance. You have a huge challenge in front of you. And it's not just integration, it's at the level of conceptualization. Uh, when I was with uh, ACFA, one of the things we did was review the economic growth strategy. And um, the economists told me that there was, at USAID, told me there was no link between economics and governance, that, that in fact they don't correlate. So my homework assignment was to write a lengthy memo surveying the new literature because they were all neoclassical economists. You got a recruitment challenge, you got to get some people in there that know what Dan referred to, Doug North and the new institutional economics. Or to add to your reading list, David, uh, they could go back to Adam Smith, you know, rough contemporary of some of the people you were talking about, who understood these points. But that flips back. I, I picked on the economists first because I didn't want you to think I was picking on you. It flips back governance is economics, is democracy. You know, we talk about the democratic system of government. But your point about Muhammad Bouazizi is exactly right with one small exception. He didn't have a title. He didn't have any property rights. He was locked out of the system by an impenetrable wall of red tape and vested privileges. And that's a political issue. That's an issue of law, it's an issue of politics. And it isn't just the 63 others. And Hernando de Soto actually did go to Tunisia and meet with Mohamed Bouazizi's brother and asked him, what would Mohamed Bouazizi say if he could come back and talk to us? He would say, you took away my property. You expropriated me. I want the right to be in business. I want the right. And this was not an uneducated, rural, illiterate person. This was a person that simply couldn't get through the impenetrable system. And that Mohamed Bouazizi's of the world in many countries are 50 to 60% of the workforce. 
They're 30 to 40 percent of the economy. And it's not just Hernando that says that. Friedrich Schneider says it. I'm adding to your reading list. Friedrich Schneider from the, from the Labor Institute in Vienna. There's a lot of people that are doing business indicators. There's a lot of evidence of this, that politics is economics, that there is not a separation, that it's not about integrating, it's about reconceptualizing. Happy to help if I can. But you have a huge challenge. We're, CSIS uh, is going to be putting out a report next month on the in, inter, intersection of economic growth and good governance. And so I actually applaud. Thank you, John. So that actually was great. I'm, I completely agree with everything you said. And I also think that the issue of um, re reflecting the new literature and the new research is something that I think is, was important to incorporate into this new strategy. And some of it's, it's reflected here, though. Some of it, that, but we, we will suggest some, some uh, weekend reading for our friends at, at USA. Nancy, please. Uh, Nancy Boswell with American University's Law School's Program on Anti-Corruption. Uh, congratulations. Uh, I agree with many of the positive things that have been said, but going back to the magpie, uh, approach and, and concern about things falling off the table. Um, Anti-corruption uh, was an issue that USAID showed early leadership on in the 94 time frame. 2005, we have a strategy. 2009, we have a handbook. Um, I wasn't on a plane, so I haven't had a chance to read this very closely, but looking at it while we were in this discussion, um, corruption is referenced as a damaging uh, problem, but it isn't uh, at least to what I saw uh, articulated, there, there's no what do I do tomorrow to what our speaker said, uh, direction to how does this apply, how is this integrated into um, what, what this strategy is supposed to do. And I think uh, similar to John, unless we pay attention to the anti-corruption component, we have uh, anti-corruption was the main, uh, or corruption was the main issue in Tunisia. Uh, so unless we deal with that in a forthright and articulated way, I'm not sure we're going to make progress. Mary, Mary Kate, the, the woman in the, just, she's right there, yes. <laughs> Thank you. In the Halloween colors, that's me. Um, hi, I'm Carmen Lane. I'm with DAI, um, previously with NDI, so I come a little bit more out of the democracy side of the house. Um, first, I, I want to congratulate you, and I think the emphasis on inclusion and integration is uh, exciting. Uh, but I have a concern. I guess it's more of a comment that I would like a comment on. Um, I share Jennifer's concern that integration might be a hidden word for economy. Uh, that's one concern. Um, but secondly, having worked mostly with political institutions personally, political parties and parliaments. Um, I always have the concern that with the emphasis on the demand side, um, that we may set up institutions for not being able to respond. So I was pleased that David made uh, the point that there will still be an, an emphasis on core institutions. My question with the integration piece of it is that when we start to blend the institutional, particularly politi more political institutions, with um, thematic areas such as health. Uh, let me back up and say, I think the most successful political institution building programs are process oriented um, and are very careful to stay out of the outcome of legislation, for example, and let that be left up to the actors in the country. And I'm a little bit concerned with an integration agenda that there may be a blending of these two that actually steps on our ability to work with these institutions. Okay, so why don't, I'm gonna ask uh, our two friends uh, to my right to respond to all three questions, and I'd like the panelists, to the extent they wanna pick and choose, to, to, to uh, add their, their thoughts as well. Sure. Uh, on John, I couldn't agree with more. I, uh, I think the contemporary version of the economic science has lost the great tradition of Adam Smith, Friedrich Hayek, Karl Marx in terms of his analytical abilities, all the way up to John Maynard Keynes, and I think that needs to be restored, and it's a huge conceptual implementation challenge, and I invite John's support on that. On Nancy's comment on anti-corruption, if I didn't utter the words anti-corruption, uh, forgive me, because it's always on the front side of my brain. 
our whole accountability objective is all about different mechanisms of anti-corruption, whether within the state itself or vertical uh, measures of uh, anti-corruption efforts from the bottom up. Our whole, our whole politi political economy bent to our integration of democracy, and this gets into Carmen's point, our, our whole, the whole thrust of our work in social and economic sectors could be reduced to the term anti-corruption. It's about using participation and accountability mechanisms and inclusion to attack politically economic uh, forms of corruption, to put it simply. On Carmen's point, I, I might disagree with you a little bit, but I, I, I may misunderstand. For us, we are trying to gently, modestly politicize the work of social economic uh, support. And that is, we believe that, a la John, that, and Nancy, that, building coalitions of policy reform within other sectors, whether it be economic growth, what's the institutional support for markets, uh, or others. They, they, they need to build political and economic coalitions uh, to address those uh, dysfunctionalities of the political economy, and there's no way around it. And to just, if that endangers our nuts and bolts work in the health sector, agriculture, I hope it would not, but I also think that 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 other work is very limited without the, the broader political e economic policy reform approach that groups like, for example, the Asia Foundation or SIP um, are masters at. Just two quick uh, addendums to da David's point. So one, John, we are trying to bring uh, the neoclassical economists into the 21st century and, and bridge that gap that you talk about. Um, we just last week had a uh, discussion on how to bridge, you know, what they're doing with the work we're doing on political economy and really set up a working group within USAID that, that, that talks through these issues. So, you know, we'll invite you to help us, uh, uh, you know, work that through. The, the other point, and just building on what David said, I mean, I think the three questions in a sense were, you know, part of a package. Um, the way I look at, you know, the work we're trying to do in the, uh, you know, in the integration sphere is that to me, um, the biggest, uh, you know, obstacle to development in the health sector, in the agriculture sector, is not resources, is not technical knowledge. It really is the, the issue of politics. And unless we break that, that down, unless we understand that, much better. We are not going to have success, uh, sustainable success, in our work in those sectors. So it's, it's a very um, utilitarian argument for achieving success in those areas that, that I would put on the table. Comments from the panelists? I'll, I'll pass in the interest of time. Okay, I've got uh, one question. Uh, actually, I've got two questions for you guys, and I'm going to ask, ask uh, other folks from the audience. I want to. I didn't see a lot on religious freedom, and I'd be interested on your where where religious freedom is uh, in this document and in your strategy. And then, second, uh, if we're so big on transparency and assistance, and I think that's a positive thing, how are we protecting dissidents or human rights activists who are getting uh, U.S. government money while answering the mail on some of the bigger pushes on aid transparency, which is a bigger part of the development conversation? So I'll take a couple. My, my friend from the Solidarity Center and my friend at the back of the room. Uh, Mark Hankin from the Solidarity Center. Well, thanks again for being here and thanks for working so hard on the strategy. There's certainly much that we appreciate in the strategy, including inclusiveness, and it's something that the International Labor Organization has been working on through its work around decent work, uh, which talks about how people get to a place where they do decent work that provides dignity to them. But I want to ask uh, another question, and the question is, obviously given the traditional re uh, resistance within the agency to this sort of work, how are you working with other stakeholders outside the agency, including the Congress and, and the State Department and the NSC on this, to promote it forward, given the fact that the center, as much as we love it, doesn't have the lift to move a lot of this on its own? My friend Kelly in the back. Um, Kelly Curry from the Project 2049 Institute. Um, I wanted to ask how, when you're developing this, thinking about China, which is, um, as Jim brings up, brings a lot of challenges into this, both conceptually and implementation-wise. Um, it really is the biggest challenge, I think, to our 
um, kind of the global project to promote democracy and good governance and, and human rights. And then the other question I have is also on a more practical side on implementation. As somebody who's just re-entered the project and programming world after a 10-year hiatus of not running a program on the ground and doing it now, the reporting, the evaluation metrics, the F indicators, all of this stuff that just keeps getting layered and layered and layered on top of people who are implementing on the ground doesn't really help implementation in a lot of ways. And it does make it more difficult to achieve localization. And how, if you are really trying to support local mechanisms, which are critical not only to successful implementation but to democratization, does this factor in and are you going to add a whole new level of indicators that we all have to deal with as the part of implementing this strategy? Okay, folks. <laughs> we'll, take, we'll go back. We'll go down this way. Okay. Thanks for the great questions. Uh, Dan's questions on religious freedom. I believe the only mention of religious freedom is in the context, in the strategy, is in the context of, of rights and inclusion. Yeah, that's and why I asked it. But certainly, uh, the inclusion of religious and ethnic minorities we see is a big, big part of our agenda on inclusive development as well as the promotion and protection of human rights. So if it doesn't appear more than once, it was not uh, oversight as much as we include that category of minorities. I, I our had work. to use a micron, uh, electron microscope okay. to find that. So I just would just flag that for, uh, for the next revision and we'll look forward to having you guys come back and talk about religious freedom, but yes. Uh, on the question of uh, transparency, we, we care very much in our human rights work of, uh, of internet security and the physical security of human rights defenders all around the world, particularly in closing spaces. While there, we are part, we the US government, USAID are part of the open data, open government movement. Um, we, we take very uh, seriously the concern of protecting the identity of human rights workers in uh, authoritarian settings. And we're, we, we're doing all we can within that broader context of protecting their identities, keeping them safe, and using the web as part of their mobilization tools. Uh, on Mark's point about how we're working with other interagency partners to build our strategy. We certainly are, are always um, uh, a frank with the Hill in terms of uh, the greater resources we need to carry out our work. We support, we support, uh, we, we welcome the support of the Hill and we, we make it clear that we need more support. In terms of the interagency, I think this does give us, uh, both the center but the agency in general, a seat at the table in interagency policy discussions on key countries. I couldn't go to a, a, a pre brief meeting for our administrator this morning on Egypt. He was heading off to a principal's meeting, uh, but he wanted a briefing. Uh, one of my colleagues went instead. So I think the elevation of democracy and human rights generally and through this strategy has given us a greater seat at the interagency table. On, on Kelly's point on China, it's well taken. AID, uh, as many of you know, have had small programs in China in the rule of law area on uh, local elections that IRI uh, pioneered uh, a decade or more ago. We're getting increasing pressure from our Hill colleagues to end our China programs because of the, the, the new wealth in China and the governmental surpluses. So uh, we consider China in the same category as countries like Libya that do have great wealth and their external economic uh, position is quite strong, but we, we do think that we question whether or not they will devote the resources to these very key issues of political reform. So we welcome your support in, di in discussing uh, with the Hill our, our interest in continued work in countries like China. Uh, Larry. Oh, let me just add on China, because uh, I approach it from a slightly different perspective than David does, in that uh, the Bureau uh, of Policy Planning and Learning is responsible for, at the policy level, our engagement with other donors. And China now fits in that category uh, as another donor, as I think uh, Jim was referencing earlier. So we're looking at, and I think it's a, it's a challenge, we're, we're going to have a, a meeting in a couple of weeks that's focusing on, in general, the emerging donors, and that includes not only China, but Brazil, India, uh, <coughs> uh, South Africa, et cetera. And, and it is a challenge for us to ensure that the type of uh, conception that not only uh, is reflected in this strategy document, but, but more broadly in the consensus among uh, the DAC donors that has emerged over the past 20 years, 
and how is that you know shared with uh, these new emerging donors? And and it's you know China is probably the extreme, uh, but I was at a conference about a year and a half ago uh, that was sponsored by Wilton Park folks, and they uh, specifically on this issue. And it was clear that, that there was, uh, you know, a divergence. I mean, China wasn't in the room, but even with the folks in the room from Brazil and Indonesia and India. So I think we need to think about uh, how we project uh, our values in the discourse with emerging donors that haven't necessarily bought on to the same consensus uh, that has emerged over the last 20 years. They're clearly players in this field. I mean, you know, anyone who goes to Africa sees that uh, day in and day out, uh, and and clearly we want to ensure you know that some of the the uh, impact that we're trying to achieve uh, is more uh, is be best coordinated with all those who are involved. But I think this is going to be a serious challenge um, that we need to uh, to address. Just a, a quick self-promotion plug: we did a uh, report on foreign assistance transitions, looking at middle-income countries. My take is we shouldn't be paying for folks tuberculosis if they've got space exploration programs or starter foreign aid programs. Uh, but I do think we should be funding human rights, democracy work in places like China because they sure as heck aren't going to spend the money on that sort of stuff. And so I also think we need to shift our relationships to a cooperation paradigm. But I want to hear, there's several, uh, I'm hoping there are some comments from the panelists on, on some of the questions. I'll start with you, Jennifer. So I just wanted to follow up on the transparency issue. Um, I think, you know, I, I hear you, David, on what the center's trying to do, but I think cumulatively the State Department and AID for security reasons and frankly as part of this never-ending quest for more information, more detail, exactly what's going on in the ground, you know, the need for control and absolute knowledge that whatever the money is going to, it's we know who it's going to, and it's not going to be anybody that ever says, you know, name it. There's a ter you know, okay, of course we don't want to give it to terrorists, but the way that it's been implemented, of course, has meant that, for instance, before certain programs um, can be started in very repressive countries that we're being, you know, we, sorry, Freedom House, I'm still on the board, so, you know, freedom, groups like Freedom House and others are being asked for very detailed information that we have to get from our local counterparts, passports, births, you know, their mother, their father, their, um, you know, what their board members are, et cetera. This just increases paranoia, and it's not because we don't trust the people in the DRG center. The problem is, is that information goes into other parts of the U.S. government, and Repressive governments have a very, very sophisticated way of using FOIA requests, which don't go directly to the DRG Center, and that information gets out, and it leads to backlash against those groups and those individuals who are in a very precarious position. So I, I think that it, it's, it's back to sort of the stability, security, because those folks want maximum information. And I, I just worry if the trends continue that USAID is actually going to get itself out of really being a cutting edge civil society um, organization and into sort of the easy stuff that can be sort of okay for the US government to do, which, and, and then you're going to have to look to the NED and others, um, but they're not going to have the diplomatic protection that the US at least used to offer. So I think there's this sort of open transparency, local government ownership, et cetera, and then there's protect the people that are actually speaking up. And that's not just in Iran and Cuba. It's in South Africa. Talk to the people that are trying to buck the government in South Africa and what's happening to them. So let's not close our eyes that democratically elected governments are going after their critics. We could go another hour. I apologize. I know there are many questions that are left unanswered. I apologize, but we do have to end it here. I'm going to ask everyone to join me in thanking the panelists and our speakers. Good job. Thank you.